Had there ever been one peaceful morning in their family? Now. You can't wait, Mia thought gloomily, wandering around the kitchen with zombie energy. She had waited until late last night for her eldest daughter, Pam, to arrive. The legend of her friend's birthday party was hard to believe. Pam hadn't asked her mother for money for a present or even made any attempt to dress up. Pam had her own way of dressing. And in vain, Mia tried to convince her daughter to wear something different once in a while. She wore her jeans to school without rips in the knees, and t-shirts always black and always with some scary face on them. Mia didn't have the energy or time to understand what lurked in the concept of youth subculture. She only assumed that her daughter identified herself as a goth. Where else would this attraction to all things dark come from? Pam was fourteen years old. She promised to be a real beauty in the future, and already resembled a young Marina Vladi. If she'd only wished it, she'd have had no shortage of suitors. But Pam behaved so defiantly that she was considered strange in class. Boys didn't dare approach her. Girls would twiddle their thumbs. Teachers called Mia over and over again and demanded that she have a serious talk with her daughter. Of course, the school has no uniforms, but there is still some sort of dress code. At least it's desirable. And a t-shirt with a skeleton, which also glows in the dark, does not fit into it. That strand of hair dyed blood red. Tell the girl that's not allowed. Convince the class teacher. Well, school isn't a free-for-all after all. Let's tomorrow one of the boys will come with a green eroticism, another will wear a nose ring, the third will get a tattoo on her cheeks, and instead of class, we'll all sit around looking at each other. Do you realize you'll be kicked out of school? Mia asked Pam tiredly when she got home. Her daughter was chewing gum in her mouth. I'll go to another school. They'll kick you out of any school, so I'm going to go work at the cemetery. As what? Wait, what are you talking about? Who'll let you do that? You're still a minor. What are you going to do there, you tell me? Calm down. Not a dead man. Pam was inflating a giant bubble, popping it. Once again, Mia would give up, leave the room with her whiskey. And now Pam sleeps on her own, feeling no responsibility. If she wants to sleep, she sleeps. And Mia's in charge of everything. Wake her up. Feed her breakfast. Remind her daughter not to forget anything. For the thousandth time, tell her not to wear the monster t-shirt and get her off to school. Mia walks into Pam's room and immediately turns on the light. This is her first move here. The thing is, there's a nightstand in the right corner, and on it is a terrarium, and in it is a black tarantula. Of course, other girls have kitties or little fluffy dogs. We got this. When Pam brought in the black monster, clutching the jar fondly to her chest, Mia tried to make a scene. She said she could never sleep knowing the thing lived in the house and could escape. Don't drift, the old woman advised her daughter. I'll leave, Mia threatened. Come on, where are you going to leave, Alex? In her daughter's voice, Mia suddenly felt a suffering note. I'd rather Jerry and I go away. We'll go out into the world looking for a good family. Pam shook the jar. The spider tried to keep its balance, resting all its paws on the slippery walls. Mia covered her eyes in fear. With that, she admitted that she had given up. Better to be mauled by a spider than to be scrambling around looking for her daughter tonight. Pam would do it. She'd really leave. Since then, Mia's been careful not to visit her daughter. The room is guarded by Jerry the Tarantula, Pam would say, and then add, Jerry's a glutton. Just then, Mia cast a hunted look into the corner. Something seemed to be moving in the terrarium. So the spider was home, and it wouldn't be coming at her any time soon. The terrarium is covered. Pam was sleeping so peacefully. Surely she had a day off, not a math test that would decide whether she'd get a D or a C for the quarter. Get up, Mia called out to her daughter. Pam didn't even mumble anything in response, so she didn't hear. She had to look back at Jerry again and come over and give her a pat on the shoulder. Make the coffee stronger, Pam muttered. And this was just the beginning of the merry-go-round. Her daughter would make up until the very moment when being late for school became almost inevitable, and then, sipping her strong coffee, careful not to wipe her glistening purple lips on the rim of the cup, she would grumble. The drink was already cold, and there was no time to brew fresh coffee. At least she has time to chew her sandwich. Mia returns to the kitchen and sees that Alex is already sitting at the table. Mom, he calls out. How do you know it's me? Mia raises her eyebrows involuntarily.
Alex was born blind, but the rest of his senses have only become more acute over the years, and there is no limit to this perfection. Mia wonders how he recognized her this time. Maybe by the smell of his favorite perfume? Or did she touch him with the edge of her silk robe? Her son guesses what she's thinking and laughs. In her steps, Pam stomps like an elephant in her sleep. And Mia pours the semolina into a bowl, places a spoon in front of her son. He takes it without hesitation. He heard the place where it slightly clinked on the table. Alex has learned everything in this apartment. Distances, turns, smells, sounds. He navigates so freely here that it's impossible to tell that the boy lives in the realm of darkness. And Mia also thinks, Alex must be the only child on earth who likes Semolina. She puts her hand on the top of her son's head. Anne called, she's coming over a little later today. You'll be home for an hour, right? Pfft, Alex snorts dismissively. That means, of course. The nanny usually opens the door at quarter to eight. She has her own key. But this morning Anne has to go to the clinic which means she'll be late. Alex is such a sensible and responsible boy that he can stay alone all day if you leave food on the table for him. Mia knows what he'd do for fun, listen to another horror movie on his laptop, downloaded a lot of them, or turn on some game. But of course, it doesn't occur to Mia to leave her son alone for long. Pam appears, picks up a cup of coffee, and after a moment, Mia repeats with her in unison, it's cold again. You know I'm starting, Pam. Warm it up yourself. And where did you get that white powder? If my homeroom teacher calls me, Pam is now speaking for her mother. You're not going to see my homeroom teacher anymore. I will deal with her myself. Deal? Mia looks at the round clock hanging over the refrigerator and waves her hand in frustration, saying, Do whatever you want. She's already late, and she's ungodly late. It's the day she has the worst luck of her life. It's a half-hour drive to work. But on the South Highway, Mia gets into such a traffic jam that she beats the steering wheel of her old car in frustration. She'll never get out of here. Mia, interior designer. And right now, in these minutes, a client is coming to her. Mia knows how demanding and dissatisfied the client is. He's usually picky even with things he likes. Either he wants her to lower the price, or he just likes to spoil the mood of those he pays. Now in her project, he will find... In addition to the usual one hundred and a thousand errors will be revenge for lateness, and Mia will finish her day with a headache. But it was even worse than she'd anticipated. When Mia got to the office, Kate's secretary said to her, still on the computer, Been gone. You'll be on the supervisor's carpet when the supervisor gets back. Well, that's this afternoon. Also, call this number. Kate slid a slip of paper to her. Mia took it. Who is it? She asked with involuntary fear. Kate shrugged her shoulders. Says the notary asked you to call today? Didn't say what he wanted. Another shrug. Kate is a living transmitter of information, and she alone belongs to that not-too-common type of woman who is not interested in additional information in the form of news and gossip. Kate only cares about her own life. At the moment, the approaching wedding. And passionately, she can only talk about it. Mia sits down at her desk, covers her eyes and sighs deeply several times. She adjusts herself. She was once advised to do all unpleasant things at once. And if fate is preparing another nasty thing for her, it's better to get through it right now. But coffee, coffee, coffee. A small cup at home, she didn't have time for breakfast. At least Pam had time to eat her sandwiches. I mean, it's a zab debt. That's what it is. Maybe this isn't a notary at all, but a prank. Before calling, Mia enters the phone number into the computer and makes sure that it really belongs to the notary's office. Only then does she take her last breath. She decides to dial six digits. The other end is waiting for her call. You need to come to use, a man's voice tells her. From the intonation, it sounds like it belongs to an elderly man. The thing is, you've been left an inner retance. Mary, Mia's co-worker involuntarily laughed. The young woman's face had become so confused, her eyes flapping childishly. From whom? Me? My inheritance? Judging by your surname, it's a rare one from a relative quite distant, from a third cousin's grandmother. Will you be able to come today? I work until six o'clock. The address? No, I've already looked it up, Mia interrupted. Okay, yes I am. I'm on my lunch break. It was still a long time before noon, but Mia couldn't concentrate on work. She couldn't hold back a laugh or ruffle her long, wavy hair. 
Even Kate noticed it. When you go to the chief, comb your hair, because you look like you've got it. I fell down the hayloft, and Mia gave her a confused, bewildered smile, Kate thought. It was the last thing on Mia's mind that Natalie would mention her in her will. She'd seen her own grandmother once in her life, and that was by accident. They'd ended up at the same sanitarium together. Back then, Mia had a husband, Jack, who thought Alex could be cured if he put his mind to it. The husband worked his ass off at work, bought expensive trips. And there, in Piatigorsk, in the queue for procedures, Veronica talked to an old lady who turned out to be her namesake. No way. The lady was so amazed that she took her hand. Are you from that town too? By husband? No. Mia was just as surprised. My father asked since he had no son, just me. He asked me not to change my last name during the marriage, so that it would remain the same when he was gone. We began to consider ourselves relatives, and found out that fate had brought together in one health resort a third cousin, grandmother and granddaughter. Mia realized that her relative was rich not in comparison with her, but in general. Natalie had a sense of natural aristocracy. Despite her advanced years, she wore elegant dresses, and Mia was afraid to think about how much the old lady's jewelry cost. But at the same time, the great aunt did not flaunt this luxury. Everything looked organic on her. Natalie asked her granddaughter about her life. Mia certainly had a premonition that Jack wouldn't stand the test of a sick child and would eventually leave. She was very restrained. She said she wasn't working, and even in a way neglected her older daughter because her attention was now needed by her youngest. There was always something going on with Alex back then. He was too young and hadn't learned to be careful yet. Bruises and abrasions were just a matter of life. Mia was afraid to let her son out of her sight for even a minute, lest something irreparable happen to him. He wouldn't fall down the stairs or run out into the road. Natalie patted the boy's shoulder affectionately. What a wonderful child. He doesn't have any problems except his eyesight, she said. Almost. And Mia suddenly told the old lady something that only she and her husband knew. Alex, we also have a sleepwalker. Turns out Natalie had asked her realtor friend to show the house to the new tenants. The old lady was friends with this woman, and May knew well not only the rooms, but even the nooks and crannies of the mansion. The two of them decided to go together. Mia took Pam with her for moral support. When the notary familiarized the young woman with the will, her great-aunt Mia asked, How come I'm the only heir? Or is there anyone else who can claim this house? The notary cleared his throat, then hesitated for a few seconds, searching for words. You see, Natalie and her husband had an apartment where they lived. A beautiful apartment, very large in the city, right in the center. It's convenient for old people, you know, to have everything close by. And this mansion? This mansion originally belonged to your grandmother's husband. I can't tell you for sure, but I think it's been in the family for generations. It's been in their family for a long time. They used to come here for the summer. The couple, I mean. Thomas has a daughter from his first marriage. She's a wealthy woman. Her husband's a famous writer. Well, you see, Thomas wasn't as concerned about her future as he was about what would happen to his wife if he left early. That's why his will is written in such a way that during Natalie's lifetime, all property, movable and immovable, is hers to dispose of. When she is gone, the apartment and bank deposits go to her daughter. But the mansion, Natalie could do with as she pleased. And so she bequeathed it to you. So she had her reasons. Legally, it's all clear. You can move into the house, rent it out or sell it. What might arise in practice? The notary chewed his lip. I don't rule out that Lily will try to get her hands on the mansion. Have you seen it? Mia shook her head. It's, you know, very atmospheric. There's some other legends about it. And Lily's husband writes not just novels, but horror novels. I don't take it seriously, but let's imagine her feelings and try to anticipate her next steps. Lily rarely saw her father. She and his second wife couldn't stand each other. Natalie's upbringing and demeanor meant a lot to her, and Lily was a flighty lady. She's going to pretend to be some old lady to get her to like her. Thomas had no children in his second marriage, and it seemed Lily had no doubt that she would have everything. And suddenly the mansion, which is worth a lot of money, is being sailed away from her by some distant relative of her stepmother, to whom Natalie is the seventh water on the vine. Lily's a nobody. She can go about it in a number of ways. She could talk to you in confidence. So, uh, so-and-so. 
My husband is writing another gothic novel. He needs a certain atmosphere. Will you give us this old house? He'll name a price. Or they'll offer you something in return. For example, to buy you a bigger apartment, with good repairs. He'll argue that the mansion is very old. You will not be able to maintain it in good condition, that children need to go to school and you to work it will be far and inconvenient. She'll try to appeal, if not to her feelings of kinship, then to justice. It's her father's memory. And you, Natalie, didn't know much. And you didn't even know her husband. Anyway, it's a sly fox. My advice, if I may. Don't cheap out. Not everyone gets an inheritance like this. Think of your children. If you ever want to sell the mansion, you'll have to go to this May. She's a sharp woman and she'll get you the best price she can. You may be wondering why I'm being so frank with you. I'm not supposed to, and it's none of my business. What do you do with your inheritance? But, you see, I knew Natalie personally. I respected her very much. But you see, it was her will. Please don't listen to Lily if she tells you that old grandma's out of her mind. She was perfectly sane when she left. It was just time. She was very, very, very old, and her heart was worn out. So now Mia and Pam went to see the house. Though Mia often resented her daughter and was hurt by Pam's selfishness. The daughter herself had called it her indifference in deciding what was important in a time of need. Her mother always turned to Pam, feeling that she had the stronger character. Mia was naturally resilient. People seemed to think that if they pressed her a little, she would do what they wanted, even to her own detriment. She didn't seem too serious, short, thin, with French bangs, hair in a ponytail or loose around her shoulders, black sweater, turtleneck. Mia looked younger than her years, as if justifying the saying, a little dog is a puppy till he's old. Pam was impenetrable compared to her mother. It took a lot to surprise her. But the news was truly stunning in the truest sense of the word. So Pam said, wow, fumbled for a chair behind her and collapsed into it. Mia sat across from her, thin fingers intertwined in a lock. There was even a pleading tone in her voice. You see, I want you to see this house for yourself. Should we sell it or not? It seems very expensive to maintain a mansion like this. You have to pay some kind of tax, I think. You realize I don't have any experience with this kind of thing. Well, that's something a realtor can explain to us on a friendly basis. I don't need much in life anymore. It's all for you. You're more sober-minded than I am. Not so enthusiastic. Why don't you go check it out? You bet. Pam really got it in her head. Mia thought it had been a long time since her daughter had been on the same page with her. And now, as they drove up the driveway, her daughter leaned to the left or up in the car. She wanted to see the old house first. We're talking about the weather. Could it really be over there? Couldn't it be over there? Mia braked at the edge of the green lawn, from behind which rose a two-story house of dark gray stone. It looked like a castle in miniature, with its crenellations and turrets. Such luxury could not belong to them. But a young woman was already walking down the path toward them. She was smiling. Her hair was short-cropped gray, and on her shoulders she wore a blue shawl, heavily knitted. Mia thought she didn't look at all grasping, as the notary had presented her. Very glad you've come, the woman said. I'm May. Call me without any middle name. Look how handsome he is. It's yours now. May nodded at the house with such pride, as if it were her brainchild. Mia looked a little dumbfounded. She hadn't expected it to be such a luxurious mansion. Pam, though dazed at first, also glanced around the lawn at the house, discovering more and more treasures that looked quite gothic. A swing tied to the branch of a spreading oak tree. By the way, how many years do oaks live? Isn't this one the same age as the mansion itself? And there's the well. Isn't there any water here? Do you have to carry water in a bucket? Pam asked. Together with her mother, they walked to their new home. May was a little ahead, so Pam couldn't see the look on May's face, only hear her laughing. No, not at all. It has all the modern conveniences of a bathtub, shower, washing machine, of course. And what a lovely kitchen. Ah, said Pam reassuringly. I saw an ad the other day. There's this lady renting an apartment, all super-duper separate ten meters square. No water, no nothing, no push, pardon me, no bathroom. This aunt needs not just a tenant but a young and intelligent man, preferably spiritually enlightened. So the girls and I imagined an intelligent and enlightened lightsaurus going to work in the morning with a briefcase and a bucket full of waste products.
May swung the doors open in front of them. Sure enough, she was a butler welcoming royalty into the hall. But if they'd expected any particular luxury, there wasn't any. Yes, the house was old, and it was obvious that the owners had tried to keep it in good condition. But they hadn't spent a lot of money on a designer, and they'd done it to their own taste just to make it comfortable. May took Mia and Pam from floor to floor, opening doors for them. Mia, though she was a professional, was beginning to lose count. How many bedrooms are there? Five or six? Dining room, living room, some sort of winter garden, a study. Of course, if they'd built this house themselves, May explained, referring to the late couple, it wouldn't be so big. Why would they need so many rooms? But the last person to live there permanently was Thomas's father. But Thomas and Natalie, they only came here for the summer. Well, sometimes they'd stay through September. Thomas had a good job here. I advised them more than once to sell the mansion and buy a nice cozy dacha near the city. It's understandable that people of age are drawn to nature, peace and quiet. No, Thomas refused flatly. There's no way, he said. We can't have strangers living here. Pam, usually stingy with her emotions, had already said wow so many times that her mouth was dry. The next room Pam showed them, she fell in love with. Oh, I'm gonna live here. And Pam fell backwards onto the wide bed which was the only one in the room. The room wasn't very big, but it was very bright because of the bay window. The sun would go from one window to the other all day. It's in a tower. Wow, I'm going to live in a tower. So we'll move here. Mia's tone was half-questioning. She was definitely hesitating. Pam, on the other hand, knew no doubts. Wrapping her arms around the pillow, she squealed like a little girl. This is awesome. 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 May smiled, standing at the door. Yes, this must be the most unusual room. I was sure you'd like it. So, let's go downstairs. Mia's already figured if they do move in, she'll take the former master bedroom. And Alex would be very happy next door, in Thomas's study. On the first floor was a kitchen that made Mia think of movies about the Middle Ages. But there was not only an ancient oak table and a bench next to it, but also modern appliances such as a stove, a microwave, a refrigerator taller than a man, and a washing machine. Doesn't look quite right in the kitchen, May asked conspiratorially. It could be moved to the basement. It's very big and, most importantly, dry in the springtime, so you can store whatever you want. It's the last place you'll ever see. Let's go. Mia glanced around, but Pam appeared to be lingering in her new room, so the young woman had to follow May down the steps alone. And to be honest, Mia didn't like the basement even before she saw it. Steep steps leading down into the darkness. She immediately imagined Alex trying to explore the house on his own. And God forbid. Is there no light in here? You have to walk in here with a flashlight. How uncomfortable. There are lights, May replied. The switch is downstairs. I'm going to find it. It's on the right. There. The light came on a small lantern-shaped light under the ceiling. The basement was really big, a real shelter. But the low vaults, the cold, damp air, the dust-covered things said that if the owner's hands had ever reached this corner, it had been a long, long time ago. The house is residential and it's a mess, Mia said involuntarily. It was hard for both of them to come down here, May explained with a smile. Age, bad knees, steep steps. Thomas has rheumatism too. What's that? May intercepted the young woman's gaze. Mia was staring at the wall, or rather at the richly carved door. It was already darkened, though. May shrugged. It hadn't been opened for me, and it wasn't even going to be opened. Thomas marveled at the fine work the carver had done. No one had a key. They were afraid that if they opened the door, the carvings would be damaged. The wood is so old, so brittle. Thomas said it might not even be a door, but a trick. Well, it's just an imitation. That's the kind of thing architects used to do back in the day. So they left it like that. If the house had been small, then the extra room would have been interesting. But God forbid these rooms should be lived in. Mia wrapped her arms around her elbows. She was cognizant. May noticed the gesture. Let's go upstairs, she said. For what's good, if it's a hot, hot summer... You can always come down to the basement to cool off. It's like a refrigerator. Thomas told me he used to keep wine in here. He made homemade. And indeed, once they got upstairs, the warmth enveloped them. It was bliss. 
It was like a warm air bath. So move in, darlings, don't listen to anyone, May said. If anyone tells you any scary stories about this house, take them as fairy tales. I know that. For a long time there was silence near the old mansion, broken only by the rustling of trees or the sound of rain. And all that ended when an old car pulled up to the house, followed by a large truck. Mia, having arrived home this time, tried to remember what of the furniture in the new place there is, and what should be transported by all means. When it turned out that it is impossible to do without a whole bunch of things, and still have to hire transportation and movers, it was decided to take this and that. And in the end, the picture turned out epic in the spirit of moving a gypsy camp during a fire. And it was necessary to arrange so that the tough guys did not just put the furniture where they had to. They had to move it to the rooms where it was supposed to be. Mia was ready to empty her purse because it wasn't up to her or Pam to carry the heavy closet and dresser up the stairs. Pam knew what would happen next. Mother would turn on the helpless and fragile lady. In Pam's opinion, Mother's lady turned out to be on the verge of being an idiot. Oh, please help me, I can't get this button to work. And when this helplessness is reinforced by a hefty fee, men just get molly coddled. They're ready not only to help with the buttons, but also to move cabinets, deal with electrics, gas, and everything else. Pam had a feeling this was going to be even more boring and worse than the general cleaning. It was a lot of work. And if you think of such a thing as conscience, you have to turn on and roll up your sleeves. Mother's got her tongue on her shoulder right now. What's going to happen to her next? At least right now she, Pam, could babysit her little brother. Alex seemed confused and small in his new surroundings. There, at the old apartment, not every guest could realize that the boy could not see anything. He was so well-oriented in space, everything around him was familiar. Alex could set the table, make the bed, reach out his hand, take from the shelf the toy he wanted. But what would be here? The first thing Mia did was take her son to his room. Thomas's study was still as it had been under the previous owner. Mia sat her son down on the leather couch, not really suitable for sleeping on. But soon the movers will bring the boy's bed here. In the meantime, you sit here, Mia intoned, squatting down in front of her son. Here's your tablet. I'll turn it on for you. Listen to a book. When I'm done, you and I are going to walk around the house. I'll tell you what's here, what's where. But please, I'm begging you now, I'm begging you, don't go anywhere without me. It's all stairs, the steps are very steep. Do you understand me? Mom, can we get a dog? Mia knew that her son had wanted a puppy for a long time. Perhaps she was inclined to fulfill his request someday. But it would be better to get a trained guide dog. It would be perfect for Alex. Mia guessed that such a dog was very expensive and beyond her means. But now, when life had turned so abruptly, Mia somehow hoped that everything would be better with money. A miracle could happen. For example, she will receive several large orders from rich clients. After all, it's not out of the question. Mia struggled to straighten her knees. Her back was already aching, so she rubbed it with the palm of her hand and then hurried down the hall to where a pile of stuff was growing and movers were bringing in more and more. Mia drowned in the household chores, did not notice how much time passed, but the moment came when Pam grew up in front of her and asked her mother, Are we going to eat today? She had already staggered across the yard, looked into the well and, contrary to the proverb, spit in it. Either to see how many seconds it would take to reach the bottom, or to have an ironclad argument that if the water was turned off at home, I wouldn't drink from a dirty well. Pam was now looking at her mother expectantly. Mia pulled her cell phone out of her pocket, glanced at the clock, and gasped. Oh my God, and we still haven't fed Alex, and I wanted to take you to a cafe. But how can I leave now? The gas man's gonna be here any minute. Maybe. Maybe order some food. Pizza or sushi or something while they're still bringing it in, finding this address. I saw a diner here when we were driving up. Give me your money or your card. I'll get you something. Mia went through her Percy, pull it out a couple bills. Here you go. That's all I can give you. I don't know how much they're gonna charge me to move now. Wait, are you with the spitter? Pam carefully lowered the jar of Jerry into her brightly colored Indian tassel bag. What should I leave him in such bedlam? Little chance you'll break the glass or open the lid. Who'd want to touch your monster if they saw him, and the movers would run away screaming? Mia started in, but Pam had already slammed the door. She had a good sense of direction, 
and in a quarter of an hour she was approaching the café without losing her way. It was a small place, cozy and friendly. Only six tables, covered with white tablecloths, were lined up near the window. An elderly woman, rather formidable with shoulder-length curled hair, wearing a red cathedral apron. At the sight of her only visitor she blossomed into a smile. She seemed to be waiting for the girl's first line to strike up a conversation. Most likely this café had its own circle of customers, and the waitress knew almost all the guests and was glad to include the new girl among them. Pam, meanwhile, was quickly wondering if she'd made a mistake. Maybe she should have gone to the grocery store and just gotten something for sandwiches. She wasn't going to stuff all those salad plates in her bag. Then she saw the usual fast food and calmed down. I'd like a large pizza, three cheeseburgers, two with ham and cheese and one with chicken breast. She listed. Yeah, that's pretty much it, the woman hummed as she assembled the order. You don't have to warm it up in the microwave with it, do you? Pam nodded and suddenly decided to stay in the cafe a little longer. Well, could ten minutes make up their minds? So reluctant to go back to the house. So far it looked like an anthill. And a soft-serve chocolate ice cream and a cup of coffee. Pam put a bowl of ice cream scoops on the table. She went back to get the coffee. And then she took the jar of spiders out of her bag and set it on the table closer to the window. Let Jerry see the world, too. She heard the waitress sighing convulsively somewhere off to the side. This was a test of her affability. Pam prepared for her aunt to scream, or at least kick them out. But the girl couldn't help herself. Instead of a squeal, she heard a whistle that sounded more like surprise. Something like, wow, Pam turned around. A guy about her age was standing next to the table, looking curiously at the bathhouse and its occupant. Who's that? he asked. If the boy had tried to flirt with her, Pam would have shooed him away, but she couldn't resist Jerry's interest in her. Haven't you ever seen one of these before? Just pictures, videos. The boy crouched down so that the spider was now directly in front of him. Is it a tarantula? Yes. It bites. Instead of answering, Pam opened the jar, took out Jerry and planted it on his right cheek. If you didn't look closely, you'd think a huge terry flower was blooming on her face. The waitress, by all appearances, was ready to faint at the sight. But the guy's eyes lit up with admiration. I see no bites for the owners. Sorry, I won't ask your friend to repeat the trick. After admiring the effect, Pam carefully removed the spider and kicked it back into the jar. He can actually bite, she admitted. I haven't been bitten in a long time, though. But it's no more scary than a wasp has been in years. My name is William, said the guy. Sorry again, maybe I'm boring you, but I just wanted to ask, didn't you move into that old house? Pam didn't have time to say that there's nothing wrong with gossip in this neighborhood. In fact, it's in the air, when William was accosted by a waitress. Young man, take a coffee, and please ask your new acquaintance not to let that monstrosity out again. I don't want a heart attack. Why are you so interested in this house? Pam asked as William sat down at her table with a steaming cup. She could have asked him to pick any other place, but she was too curious. Local lore. William nodded, as if teasing himself that he believed in them to some extent. Which ones? Come on, they wouldn't tell you about them in a local history museum, but everyone knows them here. I don't know. Pam leaned back in her chair and demanded, Tell me. He still couldn't believe she didn't know anything. You know the witch, he prompted. The one who lived here. In our house? No, the house came later. Did you come from far away? I fell from the moon. We lived on the other side of town. Tell me if you know something or don't be so foggy. Well, William was choosing his words because there were too many. About a thousand years ago. No, not a thousand years ago. But there was a swamp here a long time ago. They say there was a swamp instead of Moscow. Pam, arms crossed over her chest. Go on. And there lived here one, I've already realized. An old witch. Scary. Who knows what she looked like? They say, on the contrary, beautiful, young. And her cottage was on the very spot where you live now. That's where they hanged her. Why? I'm not a history buff, but we don't have witch hunts here. That's in Europe. And they didn't hang them there. They burned them at the stake. No, she wasn't going to be killed by any of the locals. 
She was supposed to heal people. People came to her for help. The witch's little house was a shabby little place, but there were those who believed she was rich. Some prince came to see her. He showered her with gold for curing his son, and the others she helped, they gave her something in return. And then common thieves sneaked in at night, hanged her on a rope so they could rob the house without interference. What kind of witch is she then? Pam sighed. She should have them all burned on the spot or bewitched. Everything that's ever been, that's how rumors get around. Most likely there was a hut in the swamp and a poor witch lived in it. Thieves killed her. They took three cents and then people made up stories. William shrugged. Maybe so, but they say she still comes out sometimes from the depths of the house that now stands where she lived. Sometimes she comes out alone, and sometimes she and her dog seek out those who killed her, or their descendants, for revenge, of course. Isn't that funny to you? You know, no. When I was a kid, I used to believe it was true. Maybe every place should have its own legend, William admitted. And what's interesting, even though I know your house is a thousand years old or something, they say that when people started seeing this witch, when she started appearing, a descendant of one of those thieves came here. He was already a rich man. Maybe he was even a good man, and he was ashamed of what his kin had done. He built a house on this spot. It even had a house church. Can you imagine? And the witch ate that kind-hearted uncle? He didn't live here himself, he just visited. Only once a year a prayer service was held in this church, to remember the innocently murdered soul. And it was sort of decided that the house would always belong only to the descendants of that family, because it was dangerous and no strangers were allowed in. And if there was to be accountability for an old sin, it would only be to those with the blood of the family. When I was a little boy, we used to sneak up to the house to look in the windows. What if we saw a witch? And we were very scared. But my grandmother is a second cousin of mine, and her husband came here all summer long for years, and nothing. Well, look for yourself. Before you build a house, you dig a pit, pour a foundation, right? Where will the witch come out of? William laughed. You're not going to kill that legend anyway. Are you still in school in 10th grade? Well, if you go to our school, you'll be considered the bravest girl who lives in a witch's house, and they tell you not to say it's nothing. And to put on a proud look and say that the witch personally promised you a meeting. Lily felt cheated. She was one of those women who had never known not only want, but also a great deal of shyness in her desires. And yet now, for the first time, she felt a bitter resentment against fate. Looking at Lily, it was hard to tell how old she was, in her forties or less, or maybe fifty. Her figure was girlishly slender, but her skin was beginning to show, which could not be hidden in the daylight, even with expensive makeup. But most of all Lily gave away her eyes, in which there was no longer any trustfulness or purity of youth. Lily married late, but she did not regret it. In her time she wanted to go out at will and then pick up a man whose name would be on the rumor. Lily set herself the goal of becoming someone's muse and achieved it. Boris was a few years younger than her, and that was another reason why Lily had to fit in. It should never have occurred to anyone to feel sorry for Boris marrying an old woman. Lily didn't think about the fact that her fate fit the saying, want to be a general wife? Marry a lieutenant? She had picked up Boris when he was an unrecognized genius and girls hung on him because they saw his talent. And because the guy in front of them was tall and handsome. A guy charming and smart, from a good family, but a truly talented person is far from always in control of himself. A higher power had hooked him and was leading him down the road that would allow him to reveal his gift. Boris himself wondered why he could not respond to the coquetry of all these ladies. But Lily was a bird of a different flight. She sensed his giftedness, this devotion to his work, the way a predator smells blood, and Lily made a bet. She talked to Boris only about literature and was ready to listen to him forever, dropping her newly taught chin on a dainty fist. Boris, whom none of the girls could ring, had fallen for this simple trick so readily that Lily chuckled inwardly. Let the girls think she had done something incredible by doing what they had failed to do. In fact, everything turned out to be very simple. Then there was Boris's first book, then his second novel, after which he was named Discovery of the Year, and thriller and horror fans fell in love with him. His third novel was screened, 
and his fourth was nominated for a prestigious literary award. Now he Ocaldo Valo 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 female fans not only appearance but also fame, which opened a wide range of opportunities. None of these young girls who now began to admire Boris's talent could take Lily's place. No one could claim the role of muse. Lily was the muse. Only she was always there, always at his right hand. Lily has long licked the old mansion and knows exactly what she will do when she becomes its mistress. She was willing to invest a lot of money to bring it up to snuff. After all, Walter Scott had his own Castle Abbott sports house under the writer's care built on the site of an old farmhouse. Stephen King has an atmospheric house, too. Fans come to see it. The King of Horrors Asylum. Here is an old mansion with its own scary past. Could fall into Lily's hands like an apple from a branch. Lily imagined. She becomes the mistress of the estate, and for the most honorable and famous guests also acts as a tour guide, arranges receptions at the highest level. This old house will outshine her friend's newfangled mansions. Lily knew the legend of the witch by heart, and was ready to tell inspirationally, as if an actress, how her ancestor, in order to wash away the sin of the whole family, arranged in the mansion smoke church. At first it was used for prayer services, and then someone pointed out to the owner an inconspicuous mound outside the cemetery fence. There rested the remains of the one who had been killed here. The ashes were taken to the church itself, and the doors were closed forever. It was said the kinsmen knew the fate of the thieves who had killed the witch, and the end of each of them was terrible. Two lines were broken forever, and only one of the murderers left offspring. But the witch had said before she died that her curse would live on forever, and Rodich feared for himself. So afraid that he didn't just seal the entrance, he brought in some witch doctor who whispered mysterious words at the door so that no one could ever let the rebellious spirit out. Lily imagined how to pitch the story. She couldn't wait for her moment. She'd persuaded her father to sign the mansion over to her, but for some reason he'd resisted and wouldn't even invite his daughter to visit when he and his wife spent summers at the old house. Jack's will was a real blow to Lily. She thought she'd get everything. Stepmother's an old woman. How much is too much? A city apartment and a bank account are enough. She doesn't even need a car. Natalie's never been behind the wheel. What her father had left to her stepmother made Lily gnash her teeth and wish Natalie would keep her husband company as soon as possible. If she was so precious, let him take her to his place. Still, it wasn't the end of her hopes. Lily knew that sooner or later the old woman would die. That she would outlive her. She was only angry that the years were passing, and Lily herself was struggling to look young. The road to her dream was very, very long. After the old woman's death, Lily had no doubts about what her will would be. Natalie had no close relatives. Naturally, the stepdaughter should be her full successor. The old woman wasn't crazy enough to leave the old house to some charitable organization. But this bitch made it worse. She found some distant relative and signed the mansion over to her. The rest of the inheritance that Lily had gotten her hands on was no consolation. She wanted the old house and only the old house. In the heat of the moment, Lily wanted to rush over to the new mistress and offer her a trade. Instead of the mansion, she was willing to buy Mia any apartment she wanted. Lily would have promised her a summer house and a yacht if she hadn't had a worm in the back of her mind. The simpleton might not be a simpleton at all and Mia might have her own reasons to hold on to the mansion and squeeze more benefits out of Lily for her worthless children. Lily wanted to pound her fist on the table and say something that would make a bosun pale. She'd gotten used to being humiliated. She decided to talk to her husband. Maybe this issue can be solved not directly, but through one of Boris's influential friends? Let this someone pretend to want to buy a house, agree on the amount, and then... Lily went to her husband's office, where she rarely went. She told everyone not to disturb Boris when he was creating. In fact, there was nothing interesting for Lily in sitting near a man when he did not notice her for hours, and sees only what is unfolding before his inner gaze. But now she was sitting there thinking how best to put it, so that Boris would catch fire with her dream and realize that she had to win the mansion back by all means. For a minute she admired the profile of her husband leaning over the papers. Boris was very good-looking, after all. If he was called to the movies to play some scion of a noble family, he would look in this role organically, like no one else. His husband wrote the old-fashioned way, first in his flying handwriting on a piece of paper, and only then, when the chapter was ready, 
transferred it to the computer memory. Because he did not have confidence in technology, laughing, Lily called his work cave painting. Boris did not immediately listen to her words. He was somewhere in his own worlds, but finally narrowed his eyebrows, trying to understand what she wants so passionately. Why? He was surprised when he realized that she was willing to put everything on the line to get the mansion. It's enough if you get to know this Mia and we go to visit her sometime and she'll give us a tour of the house. I'd like to take a look too. If Boris had wanted to hurt Lily as much as possible, he couldn't have found better words for it even then. This house won't be her house. It's mine. Boris heard such a gloomy note in his wife's words that he teased her and, wishing to reduce it to a joke, said, well, you're not going to kill this family, are you? Come on, what's wrong with you here? Boris's thoughts were already far away, but Lily's thoughts took a different course. She'd read all of her husband's novels. Monsters lived there, the most horrible things happened there. Who said it couldn't happen in life? She already knew Mia was raising a blind son. What if the boy, while walking in the garden, fell into an old well? Would a mother be able to stay where her child died? She'd be willing to give up the damn mansion for nothing. Lily will imagine with her own eyes the tragedy of the boy's disappearance and the search for him. Then someone would find the body. If only it all really looked like an accident. Lily wouldn't hesitate for a moment. She'd wish it to happen. With every fiber of her being. The first night they spent in the old house, Alex had to sleep soundly because he was terribly tired from excitement and new impressions. Why don't you lie down with me? Mom suggested. But Alex refused. He knew that the less indulgences he gave himself, the faster he would get used to his new place, get used to his room. He couldn't hide his fatigue. And his mother, after they had eaten a quick meal of cheeseburgers and drank tea, tucked him in and covered him with a blanket. Alex fell asleep instantly, but woke up a few hours later. And sleep refused to come to him again. It was possible to go to his mom's room, Alex knew her room was close by. But he also knew that in the evening his mom was exhausted. Alex had learned to tell from her breathing when she was smiling, when she was angry, and when she was a little warm. And now he felt sorry to wake her up. He tried to understand what had broken through his sleep and alarmed him enough to open his eyes. Somewhere in the distance a dog was whining again. Alex usually had a good idea where the sound was coming from. But now it was coming out the hell of it, with a bow on the side. The dog was whining from underground. It couldn't be. But the sound was disturbing to the boy. The dog was whimpering so pitifully, like it was begging for someone to come to its rescue. Alex tried to understand what had happened. Maybe a strange dog had run into their house when they were carrying things, and now it was locked up and wanted someone to come to its rescue? Could that have happened? It was unlikely that the dog would have necessarily found himself when they were alone, eating dinner and pacing back and forth in the house. Maybe it was the first time his hearing had failed him, and the dog was sitting somewhere on the front lawn. Alex wanted to help the dog, but he couldn't. His mom had warned him many times not to even think about going out at night, to be sure to wake her up. Though Alex didn't care if it was day or night, the boy sighed, and then either the dog finally quieted down, or tiredness came again. Alex fell asleep and slept until Pam woke him up. Alex knew that his nanny had refused to move here. Mom had said so with a sigh. You could understand her. She was an old woman. It wasn't easy for her to change her ways. She's not going to come all the way from the other side of town every day. So something has to be done. I'll talk to work. Maybe I'll telecommute for a while until we find you a new nanny. Mom didn't usually wake Alex up in the mornings. When Alex woke up, she had been at work for a long time. The nanny would help him get dressed if he needed help, and then call him in for breakfast. But now his sister was standing next to him. Hey, she said, why don't you eat now, because I have to go. Alex liked it in his heart that his sister didn't treat him like a crystal vase. She put the dishes on the table now and added mundanely, The house is a mess. I brought you some tea and a sandwich. You'll be alone while I go to the store and get something. No problem. Alex didn't see but guessed that his sister nodded in satisfaction. He had already memorized the most important thing in the new room. He knew where the door was and where the desk with the laptop on it was. There's a chair by the desk that's comfortable to climb into with his legs straight up. Pam knows he's alone, so he'll try to get back soon. 
but the dog whined just as Pam left. The boy flinched when he heard that pitiful sound. Then he waited, hoping the dog would be quiet as it had been during the night. No. The dog kept whining, and somewhere not far away. Alex couldn't take it anymore. He took his cane, without which he did not dare to walk in the new house, and groping the path in front of him, walked to the door, grabbed the handle. He didn't even remember how it opened toward or away from himself. Might as well try it both ways. Alex, when he looked out into the hallway, the dog's crying became even louder and more distinct, and the boy went towards that sound. He froze on the spot when his cane found no support. Involuntarily, Alex put his palm on the wall, precisely counting on holding on like that, and kept groping the space in front of him. He realized. There were steps here, and they led somewhere downward. At other times, Alex wouldn't have dared to take such a step. But now, when none of the adults were around, only he could help the dog. Alex bit his lip and carefully sat down on the top step, fumbled with his feet for the next one and climbed it. So step by step he went down, or rather slid down. If Mia had locked the basement door like she'd intended, he wouldn't have gotten in. But she'd been too busy yesterday. Moving house, gas men, electrician, thousands of things to find, and there was no way they'd gotten around to it. And the door was left open, with the key in Mia's pocket. Alex stood at the entrance and turned his face here and there. He realized that he was in a spacious room somewhere under the house. It was damp, the road was blocked by some strange objects. The dog, which had been silent for several minutes, whined again, quite close. Alex moved towards its voice, but not in a hurry, not in a hurry. Most of all, he was afraid that there was a hole or the floor would break again. That's why he carefully checked with his cane if there was any trick ahead. Only then did he take a step, when he reached the wall, or rather, the door, which should have been locked forever. Alex realized that it was the only barrier between him and the dog, not knowing that there was no handle or keyhole. He began to methodically grope the carved surface centimeter by centimeter with sensitive fingers, then rising on tiptoes, then sitting down. He stroked the door, running his fingers along the carved curls. Only such a thorough inspection allowed him to accomplish the impossible. Alex himself did not know what he pressed, but slowly and at the same time quietly, without any creaking, the door began to open, and immediately the head of a dog woke up in it. A man of knowledge would have said that this beast resembled a dog. If he had not been numb with fear, if he could have realized that it was a dog after all. Huge, almost as big as Alex. The dog was covered in some strange dust, it glowed slightly, and in the darkness of the basement the beast seemed like a ghost. But to Alex it was just a dog that had just cried. Did they lock you up? He asked, running his fingers through the animal's fur. Were you sick? The Ajar door breathed easy cold. The boy put his hand on the dog's head. Surely he was looking to it for support. Then he took a step forward. Hey, he called hesitantly. Is there anyone else out there? He listened and his sensitive ear caught a muttering somewhere far away. A groan, and then shuffling footsteps. Are you there? His voice was trembling now. Shall I let you out? He accidentally put his hand on the door, and the same invisible mechanism that had set it in motion now reversed, and the door slid forward, closing the narrow gap. Again Alex was faced with a monolithic slab, and he did not know what he had to do to make the door open again. But I didn't just hear it he said to the dog. There was someone there. I know. The dog showed no hostility. He sniffed Alex's hands, his shirt, pants, and effortless hair. You're as big as a horse, Alex told him. What horses were like, he didn't know, but it was an expression his mom often used. Is your mistress there? Asked Alex and patted the dog on the head. He whinnied. It seemed that he wanted to get out of the basement and go upstairs where there was fresh air and light. You go, and I'll follow. I can't go as fast as you, Alex told him. He wasn't so scared now. He knew that when he climbed the stairs, he would be in the hallway of his new home, and he could just climb up on all fours. No one could see him. And if anyone was looking at him, he'd have to try his best to act like a normal boy, and on all fours he would get out of the basement very quickly. Alex was ready for the dog to leave. If Pam didn't lock the door, all the dog had to do was jump on it with his front paws and it would open. 
and then freedom, the lawn, and onward. I mean, they didn't even know the dog. Why would she stay? By the way, this dog was a boy or a girl. Alex didn't know, and that's why he couldn't think of a nickname for his new acquaintance. Well, if the one would stay, of course. To Alex's surprise, the dog was waiting for him at the top of the stairs. Do you want to be my dog? asked the boy. Then behave yourself. Maybe Mom will let me keep you. For a few moments, Alex wondered what he should do now. Go to his room. He was sure he would find his way there or wait for his sister on the porch of the house. The boy chose the second option. If something unpleasant was about to happen, he preferred not to delay it. Let Pam see who he'd found. And if she wanted to support him and ask Mom to keep the dog, that would be great. And if the sister doesn't want to do it, well, that's for me to know. That's it. Once outside the house, the first thing the dog did was shake himself up. A cloud of dust rose up around him. It was obvious that he was shaken by the changes in his life, but the dog tried to hold himself with dignity. He didn't move far from Alex, and when the boy sat down on the porch, the dog laid down next to him. Alex felt the excitement of his new friend more instinctively, and he noticed, when he stroked the dog, that a small shiver ran through the animal's body from time to time. So they sat and waited. The dog was getting used to the world, and Alex realized more and more that he needed this dog. Only this dog, and no other. Suddenly the dog rose elastically. Alex hastily touched him and felt how the muscles of the beast tensed. What are you doing? And then he heard the wicket gate opening in the distance, and Pam couldn't hold back her amazed exclamation. Oh my gosh! It's theirs, the boy said to the dog. Pam saw that a huge black dog was sitting next to her brother. You meet such a one and try to cross to the other side of the street even if the beast comes with its owner and damn it in a muzzle. Where'd you get it? In the basement, Alex said. What basement? I told you not to go anywhere. My mom's gonna kill me now. Another boy might have snapped at him. But blindness had taught Alex to be patient. I didn't go anywhere. This is the basement of our house. Somebody locked the dog up. Pam, I let her out because she was crying. Yeah, well, Pam sounded distrustful. When did that interesting thing get in there? The house was quiet at night. I don't think it was just her, but someone else. Why don't you go down and see if he needs help? Pam knew her brother wasn't prone to pranks, but who the hell could have gotten into their house in the hour she'd been gone? Pam felt involuntarily guilty. She had given William her phone number yesterday, and today he had called her, asking if they could meet for at least ten minutes. Pam had been in seventh heaven at first, which meant he had managed to like her after all, and then something was wrong. The young man's voice sounded worried, and he didn't seem to be insisting on meeting because he wanted to see her so badly. It was just that what he had to report couldn't be put off. William intercepted Pam when she had just crossed the intersection that separated the quiet, green, private sector from the city streets. I'm actually going to the store. He nodded, signaling that he would keep her company tell me. Pam couldn't take it anymore. But William waited until they were out of the store. He carried the heavy bag, shook it slightly, and gathered his thoughts. I hear the boys are going to give you a fun life, he said. What's that? Pam didn't understand. I have a little brother, like you. And he told me this. You need to be prepared, if you can be prepared for it, for all sorts of unpleasant surprises. It's not my little brother's company, but he knows for sure. First, they'll come to your house to break your windows. Why? They want you to believe this house is cursed. When they're gonna do it? I don't know. Maybe even tonight. What's next? You'd have to ask them. They're pretty creative. Maybe they'll put a dead bird on the porch. Maybe they'll start setting off some firecrackers under the window at a late hour. Even if they just scare Alex, I'll kill them myself. Pam is suddenly furious. Why the hell would you tell me what they want from us? Why didn't they touch the old people who lived here before us? You see, the old folks only came for a few months and the house was empty most of the year. And he's just a way for the boys to test their courage, is that it? Just like we used to go through the cemetery at night from corner to corner. It's the same here, to test themselves to make up a hundred thousand different stories. Boys would sneak up to the house in the dark, of course, and look in the windows. They say some of them even sneaked in whether they were trying to catch the witch or hoping to find her treasure. Who knows? But it's better than a horror movie for them. 
and here you come and live here forever. Everyone knows how newcomers start, do a global renovation, change everything. There's no more witch. Instead, it's like an old movie. Typical houses, typical locks. 25 Builder Street, but they're trying their best to get you out of here. If you had a guy in your family who could kick their ass, they'd think twice. So what are you going to do to them? Well, they can make your life a real pain in the ass. I'm going home. My brother's alone. Thanks for the warning. I'll tell my mom, of course, but she's so hurt. You know, with a sick kid, it's up to me to figure out how to deal with these assholes. How about together? Pam realized to her amazement that she could make eye contact. Or what else do you call it? When you quickly look at someone and then look away, batting your eyelashes. It worked itself out. William walked her to the gate and said goodbye. I'll see if my brother can find out who the ringleader is. Come on. Maybe it'll be enough to tell their parents to flog those witch hunters. And if not, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Sounds like it. Alex is really quiet. He's easy to hurt, but I'd tear anyone up for him. Pam was surprised to find that the quiet brother had an advocate who was also willing to tear up anyone, not excluding herself. His mother would kick him out, Pam prophesied, and if she's too scared, she'll call for a cull. You tell me, is it a boy or a girl? It's a boy, Pam hummed and guessed. Are you already thinking up a nickname? Let it be just a friend, decided Alex. You describe to me what he is like. Well, how to describe this dog to a boy who doesn't even understand what black color is? He's big. Pam started, he's just very big, almost like an elephant. His ears are small and standing up and his eyes are so smart, like he's human. Friend listened to their conversation, turning his heavy muzzle here and there. Do you agree to let him stay? Alex asked his sister. He's cool. Pam reached out her hand to the dog to pat him on the head. She reached out cautiously, preparing to pull back, in case the dog growled or showed his teeth. But the friend did neither, and now her palm was on the top of his head. You know what? Let's not tell Mom you went down to the basement. It'll get us both in trouble. Let's just say the dog was just a stray. We'll ask him to stay with us until we find his owner. Pam, check the basement. I don't think he has an owner. I think he has a mistress and she's down there somewhere. Stop talking. But still, the girl decided to look. She had never seen a cellar before. She went down quickly, saw the light switch and turned on the light. What is it? Alex called out from upstairs. Cool instead. If a witch really lived here, I bet this was her room. I bet this was her room, though. Wait. Pam had spotted the door and was now looking at it. She recognized snakes, dragons, and mysterious crosses in the carvings. Was this where Alex had let the dog out? But how did he manage to open this mysterious passage? And where does it lead to? They hadn't reconciled by the time his mother arrived. So Alex was filled with the darkest of premonitions. How did you manage to open this door? Pam asked. You don't have to lie to me. I'm not. Yeah, you just felt it with your hands, that's all. God, I looked at those stairs. If my mom finds out you crawled down them alone, she'll kill me and she'll kill me for the dog too. Twice? Shut up, huh? Did you hear anything downstairs? Pam paced the room. If Alex had been sighted, they'd have fought, despite the age difference. As it was, she'd never spanked her brother, though she'd been itching to. When Mia arrived, she saw a marvelous sight, a distraught Alex, a scowling Pam, and a huge black dog blocking her way to the children's room. Mia slumped against the wall, hesitant to move. The first thing that came to her mind was that a stray dog had wandered in, attracted by the smell of food, looking rather ogre-like. I'll distract it, Mia whispered. Call somewhere. Is there a 911 in this country, or only in the movies? Come here, Pam told the dog. And the dog obeyed, but only partially. He came over to Alex and lay down at his feet. Mia took a breath. Explain to me what this monster is and where it came from. Pam glanced quickly at her brother. It followed me while I went to the store. Maybe he's lost. Let him stay with us until we find his owners. He won't hurt anyone. How do you know? What happened, Mom? Alex asked. Mia was always amazed at his ability to sense the mood of someone he hadn't seen, and he was always right. Not that he forgot about the dog, but he put off deciding its fate for later. Mia entered the room and sat down on the couch so that she could see both children. See? Here's the deal. She began. Pam already knew that tone. 
The mother was at a loss and was ready to consult them seriously, as equals. She treated Pam as a friend in such cases, and Alex, with his ingenuous questions and comments, sometimes gave her the right idea. I got a call from Lily, Jack's own daughter. Scolding? Pam asked. Because they gave the house to us and not her. No, she didn't. I thought she was going to dump a bunch of crap on me, too. She said she was going to sue me, but she just asked permission to come over with her husband. She said she wanted to get to know me better. Her husband is a famous writer, by the way. Mom, there's a reason for that. You think so? A hundred percent. It's just that she probably wants to make some kind of offer to sell her the house. That's entirely possible. And what are you going to sell? And Mia noted the concern in Pam's voice. What do you say if she offers a good price? Accept it. Pam suddenly realized she really didn't want to leave. It's weird. They've only been here for a short time, and yet so much has happened, Ed. Meeting William, the legend behind the house, the mysterious door in the basement, the dog that came out of nowhere, the invasion of boys, the expected night of boys who should have been given a fight, and the old mansion itself, which of course held a thousand more surprises. And on the other side, faceless money and boring the hell out of city flats. Can we buy an apartment or another house? Mia said cautiously. I won't cheap out, guys. We'll get an appraiser, and there'll probably be enough left over for a new car. In her heart, she was afraid that Lily would turn out to be a simple-minded aunt and try to fool her. The sad thing was, Mia knew it wasn't that hard to do. I want to stay, Pam said, and so do we. Alex was already hugging his friend around the neck. This was his first dog, but he wasn't the least bit afraid of her. Who said I was allowed to keep him? Just until we find out whose he is and don't let that beast lick your face. Do you know what kind of fangs he has? As big as your finger. When are they coming? Pam asked. They said tonight. Just like that. They don't want to put it off. So they don't want us. They want this house. And Mia nodded in thoughtful agreement with her daughter, mentally reconsidering how to express her refusal. Pam thought that Lily must know more about the house than they did. Maybe there was some treasure hidden here. I mean, what the hell? Boris usually found a reason to politely decline invitations to visit. He liked to stay home alone. It felt so good to get up from the table every now and then, straighten his stiff back, brew himself a strong cup of coffee, and stand at the window, sipping from the cup and staring out of sight. The latter meant that Boris didn't even notice the usual cityscape. At these moments it seemed to him that there, behind him, in the depths of the house lived the heroes of his next novel. And if you listen closely, you can hear what they are talking about. He might not have noticed the truck turning around in the yard, but if he closed his eyes, he could describe his heroine in great detail. Even the worn upholstery of the chair she was sitting in. For Lily, it was an ordeal to spend a week at home, not socializing with anyone. Boris, on the other hand, could imagine nothing better. But this time he agreed to accompany his wife at once. It so happened that even his wife was unfamiliar with the old mansion, and he himself had never been there. It was strange that Jack had not thought of bringing his daughter for the summer in these, in fact, suburban conditions. Lily could have been sent to another camp, taken abroad. Many times her father had taken her to Peter. He believed that it was necessary to see with his own eyes this treasure house of culture, but never to the old mansion. And even when Lily was an adult, her father married Natalie. He still didn't like it when his daughter came to visit him here. I work here, he said. Let's wait until fall. Natalie and I will move to the city, live ten minutes from you. Then you're welcome to come every weekend. That excuse, as Lily called it, seemed annoying and strange when she found a good reason to disturb the privacy of the country people. She looked at the house with avidity. She was fascinated by the columns, the high ceilings, the moldings, the fireplaces. She could only console herself with the fact that in the end she would get the mansion, but this time Lily, going to visit, reminded her of a warrior preparing for battle. A small but not black red dress, a string of pearls around her neck. Lily had painted her lips bright red as well, leaning close to the mirror. You look like a vampire, Boris said to her and didn't notice the sparkle in his wife's eyes. Mia was expecting them by eight in the evening. Isn't that too late? Lily asked as she made the appointment. Usually at nine, Mia was tucking her son in, reading to him before bed, 
and the guests would probably still be there. But here again the softness of the young woman's character was showing. Good. That's all Mia said. And yet it was as if Lily heard the hesitation in her voice. We won't stay long, she assured her. But Mia was nervous beforehand, too. She had no experience with rich guests, though now she was sort of a millionaire herself. For the kids, she would spare the potatoes. And what to serve the writer and his wife? Pam, I'm sorry to ask you this. It's beyond your age. But do you happen to know? Maybe you've heard it. What kind of wine is considered good wine? My daughter shrugged. Forget it, she advised me. They're not coming on foot. So you'll have one guest driving. Coffee, cheese, and candy. And give them a break and stop making a fuss. They're the ones who asked us to come, not us to come. It's so obvious to everyone that we just moved in. Pam agreed to walk with her brother around the house until the appointed hour. Alex really wanted to get out with his friend, to feel him treading beside him. One could always put a hand on his powerful back. But alone, who would let Alex go? Such malleability was out of Pam's character. She usually avoided giving her brother time, but now she had an interest of her own. She wanted to study the house from every angle to see where he might be in danger. It's not like you don't have a collar or leash for the beastie, Mia began. He'll walk beside me, Alex said. How do you know, dog walker? I know. Alex's voice was confident and calm, and the boy was right. The friend did more than just try on his steps. Pam was amazed to see that as soon as Alex approached the well, the dog immediately took such a position to keep between the well and the baby. Yes, your friend graduated from the academy, not otherwise. He's just been around for a long time. The dog was hot, panting with his tongue out. But Pam thought he had the most beatific expression on his face. He looked like a soldier who'd gotten a break between battles and was lounging in the sun. During the walk, Pam saw a perfect place for an ambush in the corner of the yard, behind the lilac bushes. It's hard to see if anyone's hiding there. But no one would approach the house undetected. By 8 p.m., Mia had reached the point of extreme exhaustion. She was relentlessly dusting the living room. On a low table near the couch stood coffee cups, a box of Nestle chocolates lying on the table. Cheese and cream were waiting in the refrigerator. Alex was settled in his room and he didn't seem to be in any trouble. I'll listen to a book, he said. His friend lay beside his bed. When he stretches out his paws, he's longer than a doormat, Pam noticed. That she herself had decided to spend part of the night in ambush, Pam prudently decided not to tell her mother. Her mother was nervous enough as it was. The last thing she needed was for those little shits to start smashing windows when they had guests. If precision was the courtesy of kings, then Lily was no doubt a crowned lady. The bell rang at eight sharp, and Mia sprang from her seat, glad for one thing, that the countdown was on, and if Lily was going to drop by for a little while, this servitude would soon be over. When she swung the doors open, Lily stood just ahead of her husband with a small bouquet of roses and an equally radiant smile that made Mia feel the contrast even more strongly. Nothing could embarrass this lady, and she herself felt beside her haggard, aged what was there of a hunted horse. She murmured a greeting and stepped aside. But when Boris passed by her, she was blown away by a wave of that strange feeling which she had thought she could never experience after her youth, and which had come to her in her youth only in dreams. It doesn't happen in reality, when you suddenly realize that this is the one God created just for you, just for you. Their eyes met, and the pause when they couldn't take their eyes off each other went on and on. But Lily wasn't embarrassed even here. It wasn't the first time she'd seen a woman lose her head over Boris. And this applied to both the very young and those who had already painted over their gray hair. Lily had a way of getting out of such situations. Let them look at that diamond in the wrong hands. Boris would be with her as long as she wanted him to be, Lily had no doubt. The guests settled on the couch. Mia, eyes downcast, brought out the treats. First back and forth, fussing, as Pam would say with a dismissive note, pouring coffee. Sit with us, Boris said softly. I'd like to ask you about this house. Lily gave him a sidelong glance. She hadn't heard that tone from her husband in a long time. Never. Maybe, but fine. Let him talk about the house. There was something she needed to see for herself. I'm going to go wash my hands, she said. No, no, you don't have to walk me out. I know everything here. 
Oh, yes. Mia was embarrassed. Lily walked quickly down the hallway in the direction where the bathroom was, and many other things that interested her. Suddenly she froze in place. The stairs leading to the basement, the most strictly taboo of all. A place she was never allowed to go. Now the cellar door was open and someone's cautious footsteps could be heard down there. And at that moment, the lights went out throughout the house. Mia rarely drank, though she wanted to at times. When she was very tired at work, when there wasn't a penny of money in the house, when one of the children or herself was seriously ill, and if something happened to her, what would happen to them? Mia poured so much valerian into a cup of water that the final result was like brandy. But now she was sitting opposite the man she had been in love with for half an hour, drinking a second glass of wine, and the feeling of youth and flight that had come from nowhere was still with her, where the wine came from. The guests had brought it, and there was no need to ask if it was good or not. Mia knew. Lily was running late, but Mia was glad for it. Lily reminded her of a client. Mia had spent a month working on her design for a cozy nest that changed every day to suit the lady's needs. When the design was finally finished, Mia felt like a marathon runner who had fallen at the finish line. The lady looked over and smiled a smile as radiant as Lily's and said, Now let's make it a wow effect. Boris was saying something incredibly interesting and important. But Mia only smiled, and it seemed that she was not drunk with champagne, but was floating in it, in those merry dancing bubbles. When the lights went out, she was just setting the empty glass down on the table. She shuddered violently. What is it? Her eyes did not immediately adjust to the darkness, but she seemed to notice Boris looking around. The lights are out. Maybe there's an accident somewhere. We may have to look for your wife. Hell, I had a flashlight somewhere, but I can't find it in this chaos. And we ain't never had no candles. Let's just turn on the flashlights on our phones and take these fireflies out into the hallway. The house isn't big enough for Lily to get lost. But at that moment, there was a scream. So horrible that Mia's heart stopped. After all, it was a baby screaming. Of course, William had told Pam he would be involved in whatever she was up to. They agreed to split evenly. Pam hides closer to the main entrance behind the lilac bushes, and William has a corner at the opposite end. It was just overgrown with weeds, but in the dark it was enough. Pam realized they might be sitting in ambush for nothing, but it was even worse to let it go. She told herself that as soon as the dog got used to them she could send him on night watch. In the meantime, she would have to make do with what she had. William was worried about something else. If you see the first one, shout loudly. I'm close by. Don't go throwing yourself at them. You don't know what kind of idiots are out there. I don't want you to get hurt, Pam promised. But she had no idea that it wouldn't be long before the house light suddenly went out and she saw black shadows, swooping over the fence, flooding the garden. She hadn't expected there to be so many, at least a dozen of them. She and William had been thinking of three or four boys. A gang like that wouldn't be so easy to deal with, even though they'd be younger, if they all came at once. One thing Pam knew for sure, she'd never call for help. The only weapon Pam had that William didn't know about was a glass jar. One of the boys who had been giving the others signs, showing them who and how to surround the house, was beside her with his back to her. Well, Jerry, shall we risk our lives? When you're going on a dangerous enough errand as it is and suddenly you're being thrown at. Someone's throat is encompassed from behind. A stiff elbow is choking you in the face. A huge, furry, eight-legged spider monster from horror movies or nightmare dreams is flying. The howling scream of the ringleader made his boys shiver. Their hasty flight betrayed utter panic. And the one Pam was holding broke from her grasp, fell backward, crawled backward, keeping his eyes on the grass, and then scurried away like the others. William was already rushing toward Pam, but now the girl herself was crawling across the grass, calling for her favorite. She knew Spider wouldn't answer her call but she couldn't help it. How relieved was she to see Jerry, grabbing him gently, before she put him in his place in the jar, she was ready to kiss him. Is that you? That's it. William couldn't recover from his amazement. Pam was still whispering sweetly to the spider. And William gathered his courage and stroked the black spider's back, only with one finger. Alex dreamed that his friend was missing. Maybe that's why the dream was shallow and disturbing and merged with reality. When the dog whined softly, the boy muttered, 
Have you found yourself? Where the hell have you been? He reached out to hug the dog. He heard her beside him, but his friend scurried away and whined again. It was like he was calling somewhere. Go back to sleep, said Alex. It's early. It wasn't early. It was late. The dog kept whining and it occurred to Alex that he wanted to go out, but the adults were busy and no one realized that the dog needed to open the door to the garden. A friend came to get help from him. All right, I'll let you out just for a bit. Okay. Alex got out of bed and, as he was in his pajamas, taking his cane, headed for the door. In the hallway the dog walked beside him step for step. I think you're taking me the wrong way. We need to go to the right now. The front door is that way. His friend grabbed the edge of his pajamas with his teeth and pulled him to the left. You want to go back to the basement? Alex was amazed. I thought you were glad you got out of there. Where are you going? Maybe it's locked. The dog didn't seem to risk pulling him harder for fear that the boy would fall. Let's go, Alex said. Just don't rush me. I'll do as well as I can on my own. Now Mom was home, and if she saw her son going down to the basement like a caterpillar on the stairs, she would probably whip him for the first time. The basement was open, but Alex didn't understand why his friend had brought him here. The dog had moved aside, and the boy didn't feel him near him now. Where are you? Alex called out. A friend. What did you find here? Then Alex felt someone's eyes on him. He was never wrong about these things. And then heels clomped up the stairs. It couldn't have been Pam. Her sister didn't wear heels. So, Mom, Alex called shyly. That's when the lights went out. But the boy didn't know it, but he heard a strange woman shrieking in fright. The ancient door, covered with carvings, patterns or some mysterious signs, slowly opened. Lily saw it, and Alex felt only a whiff, as if a faint breeze touched his face. A female figure stood in the doorway. To Lily, she was the epitome of nightmares. Bony face, deep-set eyes that nevertheless glowed. Angular shoulders. The woman wore a bride's outfit, blackened in places, covered in green mold in places. The woman looked at Lily who couldn't even scream in horror. She only made frantic movements with her hand somewhere behind her, as if trying to find a way out. But between her and the stairs stood a huge dog, also emitting a glow. The witch held out both hands toward the humans. One of her palms rested on Alex's head, and the boy realized. What he was seeing, seeing for the first time in his life, and the woman in the white dress that stood before him. It was the first thing that appeared to him. But no matter how long he lived, he would never see anything more beautiful in his life. And he would never be able to forget the deep sadness in the woman's entire appearance. Her black eyes. Bony, long fingers dug into Lily's hand. And as she looked into the swamp fire burning eyes, she read in them. You wanted to see me? Then let's go. Her whole body became like plasticine. Lily couldn't help but obey. She followed the witch, where there was no time, only eternity. Alex saw an ancient church lit with lights. His friend licked his cheek, saying goodbye. Don't go, Alex begged. The dog looked back once more, and in his gaze he could read human longing. With one flexible leap he crossed the boundary between the worlds. And the door began to close slowly, a greenish trace merging into an ever thinner slit. And then there was a quiet click, and the entrance closed forever. And what Alex still won't be able to forget is the scream that sounded inside. But it was already very far away, and only the boy heard it. Mia had to be brought to her senses. She had never lost consciousness before. She managed to keep her composure when an excited Pam burst into the house, followed by an unfamiliar young man. Her daughter's blue t-shirt was stained with earth. Pam was shaking the spider jar like a trophy. The lights had just been turned on so that the teens appeared before Mia and her guest in all their glory. Mom, Jerry, the most precious thing in the house, I told you. While there was a confused story about what the local boys were up to, and how they had managed to foil their plans, and what part the tarantula had played in it. About ten minutes passed. It was certainly an out-of-the-ordinary event, but Mia remembered her duties as a hostess. Take the heroes to their room. God forbid Lily sees him. And I went to look for her, because she's been gone a long time. She's either lost or something happened. And then, 
As they were walking down the hallway, they saw the basement doors open, and Alex down there, sitting on the dirt floor. Jesus Christ, my God, did you fall? Are you okay? Mia ran down the steps so fast she seemed to snap herself. Mom? asked Alex, looking up at the woman he'd never seen before. He only recognized the voice. Meeting his gaze, Mia realized everything. That was the moment her legs gave out. How? It was all she could say. Who? You? Lily? Where? The woman took her that way. Alex pointed his finger at the door. And yes, I saw the whole thing. Mia was covered in darkness. Such absolute darkness had never appeared, not even to Alex. When Boris had carried her out of the basement and brought her to her senses with Pam, the first thing Mia said was, We're leaving. We're running away from this creepy place. How squalid and dreary Pam thought their fifth-floor apartment looked to herself. Painted wallpaper in the nursery. Knocking behind the wall. A neighbor doing repairs. The sound of cars outside the window. You could foresee everything here. Like gypsy women say when they're guessing. I'll tell you, my dear, what will happen before your heart can rest. It's not going to calm down. There, on the other side of the city, there was a house left. Like a castle and adventures. And... E. Jaguar. Why did we leave there? Pam asked for the thousandth time. Alex was silent. Leaning his elbows on the windowsill, he looked down. You'd think he was looking at the yard. But both his sister and his mother knew he missed his friend. Although Mia had promised him any kind of dog he wanted. Boris had agreed to buy the mansion from her. Who would turn down a house where you have your own witch? Mia shuddered. So there was no use looking for Lily? She's not coming back, Boris said. Who should know that but me? There's a lot more mystical, unexplainable things in life than other people think. It was agreed that Boris can move right now, if he wants and is not afraid. And they'll do the paperwork a little later. Mia tried to fill her head with pressing matters, and there were enough of them. The most important thing was to show Alex the world he hadn't seen yet. Today she was going to take the children to the river station for a walk along the reservoir. For Alex, it would be as good as a trip by sea. When the phone rang, Mia was slow to pick up. Even if it was the most expensive client, she would not break her promise to the children. But it was Boris. Short conversations with him brought Mia both happiness and sharp pain. Happiness simply because he was there and the pain of never being able to be with him. No longer young, ordinary, tired, with children. And if there's one thing she can do for Boris, it's not to hang on to him, not impose herself on him. I went down to the basement and examined the door, Boris said. Mia knew after what happened he was there for the first time. It's a trick. What? Mia didn't understand. The door is wooden. It's a trick, he repeated patiently. There's nothing behind it. There are rocks. But that can't be. I can't rule out that there are stones lining the entrance, but they're so old, nailed together, even moss-covered, that it is impossible to imagine that the entrance was opened recently. What does that mean? She's not coming back. Who do you mean? Lily or the witch? Both, Boris said. The clan is a walkie. The story is over. The doors are closed. Yes. I'm waiting for you to come here with the children. After a few moments, Mia gently lowered the receiver to the lever, but those words, I'm waiting for you, continued to resound somewhere deep down, where people's hearts are.